Air for Arts is a nonprofit organization dedicated to creatives, artists, and innovators. We strive to provide a platform that supports educational, inspirational, and supportive programs for our community to enjoy and be inspired by. Through our digital platform and community events, we help emerging creatives and seasoned innovators share the fruits of their efforts. Join us as we take you on an inspirational journey through the arts to spark your imagination. My name is David Nethery, and I'm president of Air for Arts. I want to welcome you to this segment of Airtime. <clears throat> Airtime is a program which features interviews with a diverse mix of creative thinkers, creative individuals. It began 11 years ago with the Arts Incubator of Richardson, or AIR, which was the precursor to Air for Arts. For several years, our guests have been interviewed by David Fisher, who is the Assistant Director of Arts and Culture in the city of Dallas. And Susan David's interviews are always stimulating and thought provoking. And we try to bring him a diverse selection of creatives to be interviewed. Susan Morrow is the Executive Director of Air for Arts. And Susan, I would like to ask you to introduce today's very special and far away guest. <laughs> Thank you, David. This is indeed going to be an exciting segment. My pleasure to introduce Nadia Fairlam, who is, by definition, a sculpture ceramist. Uh, and actually, she does wood sculpture. Uh, she has quite a rich and uh, amazing background, as she has lived in many areas around the world. Uh, her also, uh, you know, interest and passions lie in the world of meditation and yoga and a variety of uh, physical activities involving swimming and water and all the above. So she's more than an artist, but she says her clients depict that certain energy in her, which may apply. Uh, her work has been seen and is seen in galleries all around uh, the world, art galleries. Uh, she has uh, also been featured in Condé Nast magazine on different occasions. It is my supreme pleasure to introduce Nadia Fairlam. I admire her greatly. Nadia. Thank you, Susan and David, and uh, welcome everyone to Airtime. Uh, we are glad you're here. Uh, please, again, help me welcome our guest for uh, this episode, uh, artist Nadia Fairlam. We're uh, very excited to chat with you. Um, this is our third airtime where we're uh, broadcasting from the Walkabout Office platform, and we'd like to thank the folks at Walkabout and especially CEO uh, Tony Portman for their marvelous support. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting, and we're learning new things uh, each time we get to use it. So, uh, Nadia, um, you have lived, uh, before we reveal uh, secretly where you actually are, and you're actually in a really marvelous place, um, you've lived all over the world. And I think when I asked you, uh, where are you from, you're just like, well, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. So, so how would you answer, where are you from? Oh, the way I'd answer that right now is I am from pretty much everywhere. My dad was in the military, so I was fortunate enough to grow up in um, Europe and Australia and the States. And do you, uh, do you have a favorite place that you've lived? Mm. Yeah, my favorite places so far are Germany and, and Austin, Texas. Huh. And uh, what, Sydney. <laughs> uh, what was it about uh, Germany and Austin and Sydney that made them your favorite? Yeah, Germany because it is, the culture there is so old. And we lived in tiny, tiny little towns in the middle of nowhere. And there were castles right next door to us, thousands of years old. Uh -huh. And it was just beautiful. And... I love the culture, I love the location, I love just everything about it, and that's the food. That's interesting, I mean, compared to 
Austin and, and especially Sydney, I mean, they're such new cultures, especially in their current, I mean, if you go back to indigenous people, then there, there, there are certainly old cultures there, but the, the current, uh, the current cities are really very young cities. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've lived in houses that are 500 years old, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. farms and barns that are 500 years old. And there's no comparison to living in a house that's had that many humans living in it right. for so right. long. It has a life of its own. You can feel it. You can feel the essence of it. Right. I mean, here in Texas, it's hard to find a house that's a hundred years old, let alone 500. Right. Yeah. Or castles that have been around for a couple thousand <laughs> or cultures that haven't changed much in a thousand to two thousand years. Uh -huh. Now you do actually have some Texas connections. You spent a fair amount of time here. Tell us uh, how did you end up in Texas and tell us about your time here. Yeah, so when my dad retired from the Air Force, uh, he found work there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Grapevine and Colleyville. So in 84, I think is when we moved there, 1984. So I spent from sixth grade all the way through university there in Texas and um, ended up going to get my uh, BFA out in East Texas at Stephen F. Austin State University. And tell us, and what did you, what did you study there? Tell us about, tell us about college time. Yeah, so I went to um, Stephen F. Austin because at first initially I thought I was going to get a degree in environmental science and that was the school for it out there. And then I walked into the art department and realized, oh, well, that's silly. This is where I belong. <laughs> I don't need to be anywhere else but the art department. And I took one step into the ceramics department and realized, oh, this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Had you been an artist growing up? Yeah, yeah. So pretty much as long as I can remember, my mother was pulling me out of mud puddles because I would go find whatever place to like make stuff with my hands. So if there was a puddle of mud and mud, I would sit and sculpt <laughs> it two years old or put it on the walls or and I was always constantly painting and drawing all the time, nonstop as a kid and my mother always encouraged that she always gave me art supplies pretty much from sixth grade like i said the, the other day sixth grade through college my focus was the art department and art right, so are there, are there are there any childhood nadia fairlamb sculptures still in existence huh yeah i think my sister has a couple of um ceramic slip casted little sculptures that I made when I was in second grade. Oh, wow. First grade. <laughs> I, I seriously started making like working with clay back then too. <laughs> and so, um, so you were primarily a ceramic clay, I mean, it's clay artist in college. Yeah. Yeah, so I have my BFA in sculptural ceramics and archaeology, and I did spend uh, six years in the ceramics department getting the degree and part of my master's degree also in now, what sculptural is, ceramics. What is that makes ceramics sculptural? Are there, are there non-sculptural ceramics? Yeah, so there's also then the opposite, which is functional, which would be considered pottery. Oh, so oh, okay. the work that I produced was not functional. You couldn't eat off of it or drink out of it. Whereas, you know, functional potters, they focus on pots and teapots and cups and saucers okay. and that. And so I was the opposite side. I was more of the purely decorative sculptural side of the ceramics making process. Huh. I, I, would think, I would think pots would be... Dec I guess not pots you're going to store water in. I guess they're pots you put on a bookcase that are decorative. Yeah. And pots could be sculptural, but I suppose not. Yes, yeah, they actually, they can be. So that's why I call it sculptural ceramics rather than functional. Uh -huh. and, and so what is it about mud and clay and earth that... Uh, <laughs> primal. It's extremely primal. 
primal. It's just the earth element in your hands and the human has the ability to create what they choose out of it. And it has been a human tradition. I think the oldest known pots are over 10,000 years old uh, in Japan. Um, so yeah, pottery and ceramics has been around for a little while <laughs> in the human tradition. So I love that. I love, go ahead. Is that what drew you to archaeology? Is that the, the bones and the things that people, the pots that people have made before and shards of pots and dishes and buttons and things? What is it that drew you to archaeology? Yeah, it was a combination of, yeah. Well, that started when I was a kid also, growing up around so many different various cultures with... Um, my mother was really, really adamant about making sure that I understood history and where humans came from. So when I was a kid, we would spend all of our time in art museums or history museums or science museums. And I was always drawn to whatever the oldest culture was and what humans were creating with their hands at the time, whether it was a cathedral or a piece of pottery or a chair or stone tools. And so um, that was in Europe when I was in Australia. I definitely studied the Aboriginal cultures there and the longevity of their culture. Um, that is still the oldest known continuous human culture on the planet. Um, and then when I got to Texas, what was it? Oh yeah, yeah, I got to Texas and when I was in university, I was in the ceramics department making the clay, playing around with the stuff. And there was a woman in the archaeology department that found out what I was doing. And she knew that I illustrated and she knew that I, oh, I got then also taking uh, old Caddo Indian pots, reconstructing them and then illustrating them for scientific journals. So I did that all across the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico and Central America too. And at that point in college, I was going to the archaeology digs and excavating them, taking them back to the lab, cleaning them, putting them back together and drawing them and making the pottery on the other side. So I bet you you're starting to, I mean, with all of these different places you've lived in, with all of these different, and then with this hunger for culture and for history and archaeology, I bet you you're, you would start to see the, the similarities, the unity, the the overlaps between all of these ancient cultures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, without a doubt, in art history, um, as one goes through art school, you've got to take art history classes. And so that was one of the formal moments where I could recognize the continuation of design and pattern and symbols across mm -hmm. different cultures across the planet. But I recognized that already as a child mm -hmm. living in Europe and seeing so many different European cultures and the living in Australia and going, well, that Aboriginal design looks very similar to this pattern that I see in a Renaissance cathedral. And then coming over to the States and then looking at Native American pottery and realizing, okay, this spiral pattern on this Caddo Indian pot is almost the same design on this um, uh, Minoan fresco in Crete, right? Different usage of material, similar design, and then going down to South America and realizing, okay, well, here we go again, same design motif, same symbolism, but now on a stone stele that's been carved by the Mayans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So all of those come together. It just perks that, that deep inherent knowing inside of me that we as humans, we, we know, we just know, we know where we come from. We can connect to symbols all over the planet. They all have similar meaning. It's all universal. So then that comes out now in my artwork too. Hmm. Great. So, uh, so looking at your picture, we, we see a sort of, green and verdant background. We hear some birds and uh, yeah. uh, roosters behind you. Um, tell, us, uh, tell us where you are and uh, how it is that you, you got there. Right, so I'm now living in Hawaii on the island of Oahu, which uh, to most people to understand, the best place to say is the, it's the island where Honolulu is. It's the island where Waikiki is. 
So find Waikiki in Honolulu. That's the island I'm on. And I'm living on the opposite side of the island. And this is the green lush place. And it's a really incredible tiny little town called Waimanalo. And it's agrarian and rural. And this is where my art studio is now. And um, I moved out here about 11 years ago. And what is it that uh, motivated you or possessed you or drew you to uh, why you <laughs> possessed? <laughs> yeah, well, just the same thing that most happens when most people have a major life change. Back in Austin, after I was done with university, I got married. And when my marriage ended, I was ready for different changes. And I had a meditation teacher in Austin and he traveled around the world and he was hopping out here to Hawaii and going to other places. And I thought, oh, what the heck? What do I have to lose? I go to Hawaii with a meditation teacher for a while. He took off. I stayed. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. I like this place. <laughs> and so <laughs> you can keep going. I got the meditation thing down. I'm going to now stay and focus on other parts of my life. But like I was telling you yesterday, David, when I got here to Hawaii, I definitely came with that um, howly hubris of, I can do this. I got this and ran out of money in six months and got stuck. <laughs> so six months after I moved here, the money was gone. My mother had died. My family had fallen apart. There was really nothing to go back to the States for. And I was just like, well, I can go into more debt leaving the island or I can stay here and figure this darn thing out and make it work. And so that's what I chose to do. And that's why I'm still here. And that was that was about 10 years ago that I made that decision. So what was it that you had to uh, decide or, or, or lay, lay, lay down to say, I'm going to be a working artist? I mean, because it's challenging to be a working artist, let alone to start from, uh, you know, start from a, a low From point. ground zero. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it was easy. It was an easy, easy decision to make because after I got back from my mother's funeral, I had three bucks in my pocket and about 40 grand in debt. And I, at that point, it's like, well, there's nowhere place lower to go than I can already go. I'm already in this much debt. <laughs> this is not a pretty position. I'm not proud of where I am right now. And if I'm going to do anything with the rest of my life, what would my mother want for me? Huh. No brainer. She'd want me to be an artist who wow. sent me to art school, mom. So I decided at that point, what the heck am I waiting for? I know how to do this. I know how to use these. The only thing I didn't know was the business side of it. And I just decided to go head on first. I'm going to do this. And I gave myself at that point, I gave myself three years. And I told myself, if in three years, I don't make enough money to live off of, then I'm going to throw in the towel and I'm going to go get a job <laughs> someplace. And so three at three years in, that was after, then I met Susan, right? And Susan yeah. and um, the Clark Hewlings Business Accelerator Program. And that flipped my whole life around because then I started learning how to, ah, this is how you turn art into business. And then I set another goal. Okay, three more years. If I'm not running a bigger profit and if I'm not like, making more money and if I'm not making art now like art that people want to buy and purchase mm -hmm. to keep for generations then again I'm going to throw in the towel and go get a job mm -hmm. <laughs> and after years after that I was in a gallery and about a bunch of different uh, uh, retail stores and working with interior designers and making more money to making art in Hawaii than doing any other job I'd ever had. So do you think the, the business side of the art is the, the most challenging for an artist? It can be. Some, some artists naturally run with that business brain. They just know. They, they can use their charisma. They know how to run numbers. Spreadsheets are, you know, exciting to them. I know people that just naturally run that way. It's easy for them to run a business. But, I mean, I, my guess is that, most really right brain, super creative people, it's a little bit less intuitive mm -hmm. and less natural. I know it was for me. I can sit and create all day long, but to turn this into a business where you actually have, you know, profit and loss and you mm -hmm. paying taxes and you want to buy things, mm -hmm. then that's a whole nother reality. Right, right. So, so I decided early on that 
that first three year cycle, I decided early on that I've got to learn how to run a business. Mm -hmm. This is like, this is no joke. And so I took class after class, after class, after course, after course, after course, until I hammered it in my head that running a business is equal to making the art. Mm -hmm. Both have to happen at the same time. Well, and those are, when we were talking yesterday, those, those scarce uh, times actually pushed you to branch out into some other mediums of, to sculpt with. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said yesterday. So how did I get from <laughs> ceramic sculpture and my BFA in ceramics to woodworking? Cause that's what I do now. Um, it's such another one of those, you know, really humble pie moment stories on top of the $3 left in your pocket and a whole load of debt was I was working on a, um, landscaping job here on the Island with a friend when I first moved here. And the guy, he pretty much handed me a piece of wood and some power tools and said, you're being a pain in the booty. You need to go make something. <laughs> you have so much energy that if you don't channel this, I'm kicking you off the dang job. So at that point, I realized that was another moment I realized, oh, you know what? This stuff that moves to me and through me, that energy, that creative energy, it's got to be channeled or it becomes destructive to myself and to others. Mm -hmm. So that's um yeah so that's how i got into wood sculpture <laughs> is is i picked up a piece of wood and a sander and decided i wonder what i can do with this i can't afford the kilns right now i can't afford the clay but maybe i can make art other ways and so that's what i did and do, so do you go out search where do you find your wood do do people bring it to you do you find it in stores or in, in no no stores yeah. So right now, after doing this for about eight years, I have relationships with half a dozen people here on the island that cut wood, that have sawmills. And it's at that point that now they know exactly what thickness of wood I want, what size pieces of wood I want, what species of wood that I want. And they usually stockpile things and throw it away. Or I go show up on the site and they're like, oh, Nadia, there's that pile over there I set up over for you. Nobody else is going to want it. I'm either going to throw this away, but I know you can use it. So there's a lot of relationships like that now. And then sometimes people just see what I do and call me and say, hey, I have this thingy. You want it? And then I grab it and take it. I hadn't even thought about asking about what species of wood. What I mean, what, what kind of wood mm. would work best? Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I consciously choose to do is I only use the wood species trees that grew here on the island oh. if the piece of wood i'm using did not grow on this island i won't use it it's a sustainability thing i'm just the the amount of money and junk that we put in the air and in the water from shipping stuff back and forth and flying stuff back and forth i'm gonna use what's here it's also a hawaiian oh i don't even know the right word and i'm gonna butcher this um way of being state of mind you use what you have in front of you you use what's here you live on an island you figure out how to use what's here mm -hmm. and you don't waste because when you waste then the culture starts to decline mm -hmm. um so i use a, a lot of the wood i use does not originate here on the islands in other words the species do originally grow they come from another part of the world, but the different way of humans that have come to the Hawaiian islands have always brought with them different species of trees with them. So, you know, the original canoe people that sailed across from Tahiti to from Polynesia, Oceania over here, they brought with them the coconut tree and other species of trees and plants and animals with them. That was the first migration. Um, and then after that, the, the Hauli or the white or the uh, European settlers came and they brought different trees too. So uh, the only species of tree that I use here that's native and endemic, it doesn't grow anywhere else on the planet, is the koa tree. And that's a species of acacia. And it's also one of the most expensive woods on the planet. And it is spectacular. So I do use koa and... Um, I do use other species of trees. So the monkey pod tree, which comes from Central and South America, mango from India, 
And then there's Nara and Milo, Kamani, Cuban mahogany. What else do I have? Australian cedar, sometimes eucalyptus. But those are the main ones that I use. That seems like a pretty good variety of colors and grains and uh, hardness levels and yeah yep so uh so what in so other, other than the wood what you what you're seeing or feeling in this wood um what inspires you as an artist and or or maybe where where, where do you get your inspirations for your pieces Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going back to what I was exposed to as a child and what my interests were when I was younger, um, the designs and shapes and symbols that I see multiculturally throughout time, those definitely are inspiring to me, always constantly inspiring. That's one. Another one is being out in nature and... Um, um, experiencing the natural environment I'm in. So being on an island, being in the ocean is part of what you do here. So I now surf and paddle and stand up paddle and swim and snorkel and dive and all of those things because there's more water than land. <laughs> it's more space in the water than on land. So in learning how to do all of those, well, actually, I'll backtrack a little bit. When I first moved to the island, I thought I knew how to swim and I thought I understood the ocean. And I had a couple of experiences in the ocean when the ocean said, you know what, you don't have a clue what you're doing and you're about to get hurt and other people are about to get hurt. And I realized at that time, I get to learn this new environment. I get to learn how to be in the ocean and be safe because it can change quickly. And even if you go outside in the water and you seem like you, I assume it's a certain condition, tides, currents, waves, whatever will come and tell you otherwise. <laughs> so in learning how to respect the ocean and be in it safely, learning how to paddle and stand up paddle and OC6 paddle, which is ocean canoes that have six, seat in it, six seats in it. Um, they're the kind of canoes that you paddle inter island. Um, and then learning to surf I just became fascinated with the tides, I mean, excuse me, tides and currents and the wave patterns, the movement of the water, the movement of the water below the water, the movement of the water below that layer of water, the movement of the air, the movement of the clouds, and just how all those things interplay. I mean, goodness, I mean, it's so beautiful just being in that environment. And so what I like to do is capture that in my sculpture that I make. Mm -hmm and share that, share that essence and that quality of being in the water and on the water. Um, and then the third inspiration that I get is from my meditation and visualization practice. And that's just sitting super still and asking, all right, what is it that you want me to create today? Let me know. And then I see it on the screen of my mind and then I draw it out by hand or draw it on the piece of the wood and cut it and there you go. Hmm. So you have an idea and you have a piece of wood, what is it that you use to, what tool do you use to uh, uh, make, make the wood into what you want it? Yeah, so my baby is this guy. This is what I focus on here, we put ah. it on the screen. So I have this really great German Fest tool. It is the Ferrari of jigsaws. Um, and I've gone through, I don't know, three or four of these in a couple of years. <laughs> so what I love about these tools is so the shapes and the designs and the patterns that I cut into my wood are really tight and really circular and spiral, which you'll probably be able to see on my website and my designs. And I don't use bandsaws. I use a jigsaw. I am a wood I'm an artist and I work with wood. So I use all of my tools like a sculptor would, not like a carpenter would. And that's where this guy fits in. And this guy just can cut super, super tight curves, really beautiful straight lines. And um, yeah, that's my baby. <laughs> and uh, so, you're, so you're using the, the jigsaw like a stone sculptor would use a hammer and chisel. 
In, in a way, yeah. So it's, you know, it's you're reducing. It's a reductive method when you're uh, uh, carving stone. Uh, you're reducing the material. You're taking the material out rather than being additive, like ceramics can be an additive you're adding on in some cases. Um, so with the woodworking like this, it's reductive. I'm removing pieces and bits and pieces from the original slabs of wood, taking them out to create the shapes that I want. Mm -hmm. I don't usually add back on. When I add back on, it's like adding back in a different material, glass, mm -hmm. resin, paper, paint, and gold foil, sometimes whatever gets stuck to those surfaces, <laughs> cat fur. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned your use of glass. If I, I think that's, a, tell us about your use of glass and yeah. mirror. And it seems really significant in your work. Yeah, so uh, one of the major materials that I use in my work along with the wood is mirror glass, that reflective surface. And that's for many different reasons. Um, first of all, it's really beautiful to have mirror in back and behind my shapes and designs because it gives the piece depth. It provides... It, it, it creates an, a sense of inner light, the light comes into it. And to me, I purposefully use it because I want the viewer to be involved into the piece. Because when you look into it, you're seeing a reflection of yourself in that piece and the viewer gets to be involved. So is there, a, is there an experience that you endeavor for the, the viewer of a piece of yours to experience? What is it, what is it that you want the, the viewer to feel or think or experience when they're uh, encountering one of your pieces of work? Yeah. Um, great question. I hadn't thought about that one in a while. Many different layers. Um, what I seek to encounter at looking by looking at art, what I long for is that awe, that sense of awe, that sense of something outside of myself, that sense of, sense of something that's way bigger than me, that in a way helps me leave my thinking mind mm -hmm. and get into my feeling body and my experiential brain. Um, that takes me beyond the, the heaviness or the weight of the here and now of life that can happen. And I value that a lot. And I know what does that does for me mentally and emotionally and how that helps me then in the rest of my life. And I, I want to share that too. I want, and I've had my customers say that they'll have certain pieces on the wall and they'll just sit there and sit there. And they say to me, like, gosh, you know, it's so easy for me to meditate in looking at this thing. Mm -hmm. I feel so peaceful when I'm looking at this. I'm so glad I got this. Would you please make this when you're making this? Would you make it while you're in meditation? Huh. So there are moments I'm getting paid to meditate. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I love All that. right. <laughs> I will take that. <laughs> but it is, I mean, it's, um, it's so much why we surround ourselves with art in, and beautiful things in our homes is that it reminds absolutely. us of that that elsewhere that other place that awe and we can we yeah. can have that in our in the places in the places we call home yeah and that's what before our modern day and age that's what art was about that's what architecture was about mm -hmm. heck that's what making a spoon was about a chair a building when you think of a cathedral that was meant to take the human viewer way outside of their body and outside of their mind and just, you know, be at one with God and whatever that God was to them, Christian mm -hmm. God, Buddhist God, source, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just take them into that next level of awareness. So, yeah, I mean, that's what most of art was before <laughs> our modern times. Now you're a, you're also a teacher. What, what tell us about I'm, your teaching and your students, and hopefully they get some of this inspiration yeah. and creation creativity from you. Yeah, so I'm a teaching artist also. So that means that I give back as much as I make with the art. Um, 
I love it. I love teaching art to kids. They're so much fun. They're so smart. They can connect to their creativity so much faster than even I can because they're so much closer to it. And um, I don't know why it is in our um, modern education system right now we think that it's a really good idea to, to remove art and physical education <laughs> and we I, I I shouldn't say we I'll take it to me I see the results mm -hmm. in my society in my culture I see what happens to the children around me and how frankly they just suffer and um, I'm not about to stand for that and so I give art back mm -hmm. if they don't get the art in school they can come to me and work with me here and they love it. Any kid that comes through my studio, they're just dying. They're dying to like get their hands dirty and muddy and sculpt and paint and draw and pour it on their head and smear it on their face and do what I did when I was a kid. And because not everybody learns up here and that's what I, I teach and that's what I really talk about. And that's also what I go into in my fundraiser campaign for my art school that I'm doing right now is that a lot of kids, they only learn with their body. They only learn with their hands. It's like we, some of us learn here first and then it goes in here. And then we think, why does this kid have ADD? <laughs> maybe because they're creative, maybe because they actually need to go run around in circles for a while because mm -hmm. they're little, because that's just natural to them. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to be making things with their hands because that's their natural state. So I'm, I'm very passionate about teaching art to children and I'm like physically building out a school here. And then in a couple of years when I buy my own property, I'm building a proper art school, like even bigger than this, even better than this, even more materials and tools. And soon, to, I'm, I'm not there yet, but soon I want to get to the place where it's a nonprofit, where these kids get to come in and take the classes and they don't have to pay. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of kids that don't have money that need that creative outlet. You know, I, I wonder why, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it because it's my sense, my intuition is there's a lot of angry and frustrated people out there and they take it out on others with weapons, drugs and alcohol. And if they were maybe given the opportunity to let all of that energy move to them and through them in a creative way, music, dance, art, athletics, would this place look differently it makes sense i mean yeah it's so so important in all that we do to even just not even even if you're not creating paintings or or pots or oh, yeah. paintings just the, oh. the the ability to be creative and um yeah. and to make something yeah. where nothing was before is super important right so uh, so you're yeah. building out this school and I, I assume it'll also be your studio um yeah. tell, us, tell us about that project and um, how it's coming along, and uh, I know uh, uh, Susan mentioned we'll put the the link to the the fundraising page in the credits. Um, so uh, tell us where we are and how we can help, and what you'll be able to do in this new place. Yeah, thanks. So yes, uh, about a month ago, I moved into this new art studio space, and. Um, I've been given the opportunity to start again with my art studio on this beautiful piece of land. And it's, it's rustic and uh, the infrastructure is not here. Where my old art studio was, I had the infrastructure to have a school and based on things that were out of my control and out of my hands, I got the opportunity to move to this location. So um, I get to start again in a very short period of time. So I have a month to finish the construction of my studio. That means I need a roof, I need a floor, I need electricity. And with a fundraiser right now, now um, the goal is to have, well, everything will be completed and built and constructed by the last week of May because the first week of June is when all the kids are coming and I already have kids signed up and paid for their art classes. So they're expecting the kilns and they're expecting the paint and the supplies. I even have another teacher in the, in the um, community here, another art teacher that I'm teaming up with and she's teaching the little kids. She's teaching K up to third grade and I'm teaching fourth grade all the way up to uh, seniors in high school. So she gets the little ones. I get the bigger ones. I'm teaching more of the sculpture and the more advanced forms of art. And she's teaching the painting and drawing. 
to the little ones. And um, yeah, so we've got a really great space for it. There's a lot of room and there's a lot of things that get to be built in a hurry. And so that was the purpose of the fundraiser is um, I actually, it was actually some friends of mine challenged me to do a fundraiser. Hmm. So they was said, more... go, no, go ahead. Oh yeah. They just said, well, other people ask for contributions for other reasons. Uh -huh. This is a very worthy cause bringing art and children and education back together. You, you, you can ask. And so that's what I've done. So I have a fundraiser that I started on Indiegogo and you can see the video and all of that there in the start of the school and all the different perks that I have that you get for joining in the fundraiser. How great. Contribute. Well, like I said, we'll put the link to that in the credits after the uh, video. Um, so with, with, with all of this teaching and studio making, when do you, when do you have time to make your own art? <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I have a pretty strict, um, schedule with myself. I have certain times of the day where I'm teaching classes and certain times of the day where I'm working on the production, whether it's the production for my galleries, for my clients or my wholesale customers. Mm -hmm. So I have a very strict schedule of when I do the business part, when I do the art making part and when I do the teaching part. So it fits. So it sounds like you have over the years learned a fair amount of discipline and to, to schedule oh, yeah. all, all of this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, discipline is a beautiful thing when you what, can get dialed in. We're, 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 we're wrapping up. We're running out of time. But what advice would you have for the, the, the you 20 years ago who, who has a, a, love for, a love for making things, clay or wood or whatever their medium? What advice do you have for uh, the young aspiring artist who... Who, who, like you, knows that this is the only thing they can do in their life. Do it. Don't hesitate. Don't second guess yourself. And find somebody to either be your business manager that you trust or learn it all yourself. Hmm. Don't kid yourself in thinking that you can just make art. No, you've also got to feed yourself and give back. So business is just as important as the creativity. Mm -hmm. So align with yourself with somebody that can do that and support you with that or learn how to do it yourself until your business grows big enough and then you can hire people like I'm right. getting to the point now where now I'm able to hire people. Okay, you take care of that. You take care of that. You take mm -hmm. care of that because I just want to focus on the art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's that's certainly inspiring, and I hope uh, I hope I hope in the, when, when I hope some young budding artist watches this and gets uh, gets yeah. gets inspired. Um, and I yeah. I, I want to come to I want to take a trip to Hawaii and come. <laughs> oh, you are more than welcome to. And actually, part one of the perks that I have, and you don't even have to come to Hawaii, one of my featured perks for my Indiegogo campaign is a global group creativity class. Ah. And this is going to be, I think it's on May 20, shoot, let me look, I don't want to lie. Um, yeah, so on Saturday, May 22nd, I'm teaching a Zoom class to all my friends and family all over the world. I got it figured out where most everybody's going to be awake. My friends in Paris, it will be 11 at night. And if you're in Jerusalem, it's going to be two in the morning. Sorry about that. But <laughs> I have friends and family all over the world. And I have other teaching artists all over the world that are joining in on me. So this is an hour long creativity class for kids and adults. And I'm going to be teaching and you get to come in and play. That's one of the perks of my um, fundraiser. Well, that, 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 I think that sounds marvelous. I'll have to check it yeah, out. Yeah, it's going to be um, fun. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, so, I'm so glad that we've uh, gotten a chance to talk, and I'm so glad that the uh, airtime audiences have gotten to have a little glimpse yeah. into uh, your world. We'll, um, we'll share your, your website um, in the, when, we, when we post this, and uh, please, everyone, uh, go look at her website and, and look at the marvelous, you're not sure whether they're art or architecture and functional or sculptural. They're just be beautiful, beautiful pieces. 
So um, thank you so thank much you for so much. Uh, talking with us. Now, we, uh, as, as I said yesterday, we always do end with our top 10 lightning. Oh, right. Questions. Our top 10. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, these are just going to be random questions that, uh, that I have uh, chosen specifically for you. Um, but okay. <laughs> they, they generally will give us either a laugh or a, uh, some more insight into your, uh, into your art and your personality. So okay. here we go. Question number one, Big Dipper or Man in the Moon? Oh, Big Dipper. Number two, Air, Fire, Earth, or Water? They all have to be there. <laughs> all right, I'll give you that one. Um, number three, what is one period in history you wish you could go back to and visit? Oh, Minoan culture on Crete. Wow. How they built their water systems. Poof, got to go there. Number four, uh, George Clooney or Tom Hanks? Oh, George Clooney. <laughs> uh -huh. Number five, uh, what is currently on your nightstand? Oh, oh, a candle for my girlfriend so that when she goes into labor, I light the candle and I'm there with her. Oh, wow. Number six, San Francisco, Los Angeles, or New York City? San Francisco. Number seven, the last TV show you binge watched. Oh, what was that thing called? The Queen's Gambit about chess. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That was really good. Number eight, the one movie that everyone should see at least once. Mm, the Abyss. Oh. Number nine, your favorite comfort food. Chocolate. Dark chocolate. <laughs> and number 10, since you are in Hawaii, your favorite tropical fruit or cocktail. Oh. Um, the little wild passion fruits. Oh. The little ones. Oh, wow. That, you, that don't, they don't grow on farmland. You can only just pick them when you go hiking out. Yeah, little baby passion fruit. How exciting. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone will thank our guest, Nadia Fairlam. It's been great to talk to you. And uh, we'll turn it back to David and Susan to uh, wrap us up and uh, tell us about next month. Great. What a fascinating conversation uh, with Nadia and David. Uh, great questions, David. Nadia, you indeed have an amazing background in history and such a focus. I am so excited to hear what you're planning for the future uh, with your school. Uh, this is an exciting um, and education being so important and you're taking that time to give back. This to me just rings so, so clearly and we were just delighted to have you uh, share with us that um, that segment and that part of your plans for the future. Uh, the Nadia mentioned that she is currently going to be opening her school uh, June first, and there will be uh, there is a link uh, for information and any contributions, uh, and I would like to include that on the. Um, on the credits, you will see that listed. So uh, please uh, uh, take a look at that. Also, uh, I would encourage you all uh, to take a, a go up on our website, airforarts.org. That's A I R, capital A I R, number four, arts, A R T S dot org. Thank you. I'm so excited about. Um, this interview today and obviously subsequent airtime interviews for coming months. David? Thank you, Susan. And I, I agree with you. She is a fascinating individual. Her, her art is beautiful. It's unique. Uh, her inspirations come from a number of places, including, as she said, her meditations. And she, she's a marvelous guest for today. And David, as usual, did a wonderful job. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to having you at 
our next airtime interview. And as Susan pointed out, that information will be on the Air for Arts website. Hope all of you have a wonderful day and thanks for joining us.